Greetings, Internet. Welcome to another fantabulous, fun-filled episode of The Comic Watcher Show. He's Mike. I'm Matt. Welcome back. We've been on a little bit of an extended hiatus for the majority of this summer. Um, I've had, I had COVID week of 4th of July, and uh, if you know anything about the after effects, the dreaded long COVID is 100% true. I have had no energy, no focus, no nothing. And Mike, poor Mike, I just couldn't leave him to man the turrets by himself. I, yeah. Mike, you know I love you, brother. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I couldn't have done you like that, but we are back. We're in fighting form. And this week we have none other than Zach Thompson here, not to be confused with Zach Kaplan. Let's get that out there right now. Um, <laughs> we've had Kaplan on the show twice. And the whole time, Zach, going into this, I was like, God, I know I'm going to say Kaplan. I know I'm going to say Kaplan. I know I'm going to say Kaplan. So you're just Zach tonight. But we are here to talk about um, Zach's new uh, miniseries from Aftershock, the brother of all men that he is Ooh. unleashing with artist uh, Owen Marin. And um, Zach, take it away for those who may not be familiar with this new title. Yeah. So first of all, thanks for having me. Um, this is awesome. And second of all, Brother of All Men is like a 1920s noir set uh, amongst the backdrop of real Canadian history. It follows uh, a veteran from the Great War and part-time private eye who treks out to British Columbia to track down his estranged brother, um, but is also sent out there because he was hired to find a girl. So he's kind of torn between these two masters as he infiltrates this cult called the Aquarian Foundation, which is a real cult from Canadian history. Oh, very cool. So, um, brother of all men, I don't think, and my, Mike was saying this before we started, um, and I'm just going to steal his wording because it was so great. <laughs> I don't think anybody was um, expecting a comic about uh, noir woodsy 1920s post great war cult drama uh tell you know you, you said this is based on a real series of events around a real cult uh that sprung up in um british columbia i'm assuming yep. the location is the same as in the book yep. uh so tell us a little bit about that because i'm endlessly fascinated by the weird mechanics of cults yeah um so the earliest sort of genesis of the book is like probably a decade ago now, which is crazy to say out loud. Um, I was a freelancer for Vice in Vancouver and um, a lot of the writers would get together and sort of pitch stories over beers and, and sort of just talk about uh, basically like weird subcultures. At the time, that was like Vice's whole thing was like find a weird community of people and sort of like get involved and talk to them and sort of like learn what they're all about. Huh. And so through that, um, I started talking to people about, there was a very big history of like magic and occultism um, in Vancouver specifically, but especially on Vancouver Island, which is just a little bit further West of Vancouver. Um, I don't know if it's like that in the States, but I feel like the Pacific Northwest in general just attracts weirdos and, and people who think they're magicians or, or sort of don't fit in with the rest it, of the world. It's a, it's a fascinating intersection of humanity. Let's just it put is. it that way. It is. Truly, right? Like people who like you look at the soles of their feet and they're like, I haven't worn shoes for 25 years. And you're like, I don't know if that's healthy, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so like I was really fascinated by that history of occultism out in BC and started looking into it. And that led me to some rumors that Alistair Crowley spent some time out there. Really? And so I started to dig into that and then found out that that rumor came from brother 12 actually being in uh, Victoria during the 1920s. And so it was alleged that Alistair Crowley came into Victoria and had a meeting with this cult leader known as brother 12. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. I've never heard of, of this dude. And so yeah. I started digging into it and, and finding out that like one, all of his writing is now in the public domain because he's been dead for over a hundred years. Um, two, 
that he had a cult that was about 300 people strong towards the end. And it existed in BC from 1927 into about 1934. So he was doing his thing for about seven years in BC and kind of just fell away. Um, you know, like I, I think it's one of those things where communities like to forget about those weird oblong societies that sort of like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. pop up. But when I went out to Victoria and started digging around and started talking to people, everyone there knew and and there was books and there was a lot of literature on him out west like specifically where his encampment was so i started to look into it and sort of like track sort of what this story was and and what he was doing for all these seven years and then i was like huh this is kind of the perfect setting for like a canadian wicker man style yeah. horror book and so that's how the book was born it was just like the journalist in me kind of got a whiff of something and i started to get to the bottom of it and by the end of it i was like huh i could turn this into a really fun like detective noir yeah most definitely so the fact <clears throat> the fact that it's based on real events and brother 12 was a real person are any of the other characters in the story uh based or even loosely based on any real individuals that that are part of this yarn yeah, so um, the girl that he's looking at, looking for, Myrtle, mm -hmm. um, there was a very real Myrtle in the settlement. I changed the last name and sort of changed some details because when you're writing about real people and they're kind of wrapped up in everything, I really didn't want to, even though we're 100 years removed or whatever, I didn't really want to bring people back into trauma or find a family or a granddaughter or whatever. That's like, that was the worst part of my life. So there's like through the looking glass or through the prism sort of versions of real people, but specifically sort of one degree separated from reality. So one, I could take some liberties with uh, their stories, but two also just sort of making sure that I'm not like accessing people's trauma and then sort of like turning it into entertainment for people. Um, so because there's a lot of people who are wrapped up in it and their actual sort of story and how they related to Brother 12 is very interesting. And I think sort of key to understanding who he was. But also I wanted to make sure that there was some distance because, yeah, they, they're not people who are alive that can kind of consent to the idea of sure, being in this. Story. Sure. It gets into a an ethical kind of yeah. murky slash gross area if you push it too far. I can I can dig that. Mike, what so are you doing, buddy? Yeah. No, yeah. Um, yeah, Zach, there's a lot to kind of unpack with the first two issues of, of the series. Um, and you touch on a lot of human vulnerabilities, especially with Guy and stuff like that. How organic was that process when you were kind of and separate? And I don't, hopefully, this isn't a spoiler, but you separate the books in, into chapters and kind of give each character their own playground, if you will. Um, how organic was that process? Was that like in the works from the start or did it start like, you know, with the story and then it just kind of grew from there, kind of like with their vulnerabilities and kind of touching on them and taking advantage of that and stuff. I think the big thing for me was when you're telling a, a cult story and it's about this outsider kind of coming into this commune and sort of seeing it from the outside perspective, we've seen that happen so many times in the past yeah. and I was really interested in like how do you humanize it how do you kind of again give people more perspectives on this sort of like extremely complicated thing so you can create one an engine for empathy for people to understand how someone gets wrapped up in this and possibly why um, they would be involved in this and also what they actually believe in because I felt like you wouldn't get any of that if it was all from Guy's perspective mm -hmm. and he was coming in. And like, that's cool. It builds an air of mystery and everything. But I also thought it was really important because the central sort of conflict is between two brothers who are bridged by this huge gap in terms of space, in terms of time, but also this existential gap where they don't really actually see the world the same way. Right. And I wanted to get into the heads of all those characters. So when I started to sort of break down the book, I realized... I could do this in a third person omniscient sort of narrator style and then break each uh, issue almost equally 
into eight page chapters that allowed me to sort of hone in on certain characters at certain points. So I knew the whole story going forward, but I knew that if I chose a specific POV for each sort of like pivotal thing that depending on what that POV was or who was occupying that POV, it actually might be more dramatic or more interesting because you're kind of limiting the reader from knowing what Guy feels at a moment where Bastion has this moment of vulnerability with brother 12 or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. So, and then also just like speaking selfishly as a writer, like it was also a really interesting challenge to myself to go like, how do you break this into lo and behold, 12 chapters because right. it's about brother 12. Right. Um, and then also have some fun with the formalism that comics allows you to play in. So each issue is 24 pages, separating them into three chapters. And then you get these nice little, like almost eight page micro stories. So you get like three little stories in every issue. And I think it actually makes it feel like there is like a different sense of pace to it. Mm -hmm. um, sure because there's not really another comic that I know of on the shelves right now that is paced like our book. No. And that was a specific choice. Yeah. And that's, that's another great thing I, I I'm enjoying about the series is it's such a slow burn. Um, and even with like, if you break off like the narration portion of it and then the dialogue portion, it's almost like two different stories. It's two different experiences, um, which really came through fantastic. Um, as, as Guy being a veteran and myself being a veteran, there was that part where he started to question his his place um, in the world that he knew and now his new world now with the cult. And that came through, again, magnificent because I found myself kind of going, I get it, you know? Like, I'm not yeah. going to run off and join a cult, but I get it because that, vulner again, that vulnerability that, that you hit on so well, it was like, well, I don't have a place here. I don't have a place. I may have a place here, but do I want the place here? You know, and it just, it, yeah. that, that, that separation that of almost his, his personality and experiences came through uh, really well. It was great. I'm glad to hear that. Cause like, that was a huge thing when I was researching the cult and reading about it, I was kind of like, I can, I can fuck with this. Like <laughs> I can see, I can see where they're coming from and sort of yeah. like what this ideology sort of offers to people. And then I think like, you know, it's no secret that we're kind of living through us like 100 years later, the night the 2020s are very tumultuous for people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us are asking, how do we fit into society at large? Is there space for us in the future? That kind of thing. And so I looked at a lot of my own vulnerabilities and a lot of the questions I was asking myself and kind of going, well, I can really understand that after World War One, that's how people would be feeling as well, right? Like that, just seeing that basically something that kind of shakes you to your core and you go, Hmm, the promise of society is probably not going to work out for me, right. you know, not going to work out for my family or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so you start to ask these questions about like, well, if I don't belong here and this isn't working, where do I go? What, how do I belong elsewhere? And uh, you know, that's why like cults are kind of, you know, blowing up, again these days you know and they may not be in the same form but it's like there are people who present themselves as a person who have a lot of solutions to whatever we're going through and they say all you have to do is like and subscribe or whatever and you can kind of belong to this cult of personality where we the enlightened few have these answers as to how to go forward in life yeah absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. i mean there's there's a reason that you see the the flourishing of these cults or and or cults of personality post big world shaking events you know world war one world war two mm -hmm. vietnam uh 9 11 yeah yeah uh and so on and so forth and because you know you now got like you were saying a populace whose faith is shaken and it becomes, it makes them susceptible to those easy answers because easy answers are so damn uh, satisfying. Oh, I should go live in the woods yeah. and build this ark yeah, yeah. because the world is really screwed. You see what happened 10 years ago? It was terrible. And, and, and honestly, it, you know, it's like, 
you know, that seems like a, it's a fun, great purpose, right? Like the mm -hmm. idea of like, are you really harming anyone if that's what you choose to do? Like right. if you're going out there and cutting trees down and you're like with your bros and you're having a good time and you're feeling deeply philosophical, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. It's just that like when there's someone who's exhibiting control over all of that, that's where it sort of gets bastardized sure. and like, you know, you're put into the exact same system that you're trying to escape, essentially. Yeah, yeah, just on a micro scale. And one of the ways that cults brainwash their uh, their marks, for lack of a better term, is to really break them down and deprive them of sleep, deprive them of food. Um, and we see this at the end of the first issue in a fairly extreme example when Guy and the other new members of the Aquarian Foundation are buried with only buried alive, uh, not in a coffin, mind you, but just themselves yeah. with only that bamboo shoot to breathe through for however long it was. Um, I'm curious. Now, I mean, I can definitely see uh, a cult, maybe this cult, having done this in real life, but how many of the practices in on page of the Aquarian Foundation are taken from real-world examples? So... The burying alive, for example, is uh, like, I'll be honest, complete fabrication because I was like, this is cool. And it more symbolically represents something that will become more clear as the series progresses in terms of like a payoff. And it was a way for me to visually sort of communicate that, like, you know, that feeling of vulnerability, but that overwhelming sense of committing yourself to it. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also stuff that's going to come up in issue three which they did quite frequently with people as a way to basically they've been insinuating several times that people lived multiple lives and that they mm -hmm. are vessels that hold several different consciousnesses. And that is something that they truly did believe in, but it was also a way, like you were saying, to break down people's barriers and kind of murky them, their sense of themselves so that they didn't really know who they were. They, they know who they used to be a hundred years ago and then 50 years ago. And they used to read people's astrology charts and tell them all this uh, inane stuff about the fact that they were older than trees and all this stuff <clears throat> just to kind of make it. So they were put in a position where they would quote unquote, trust the work. That was something that was constant whenever I was reading brother 12's writing is that like thought terminating cliche, which is very mm -hmm. common in cults where you you repeat something and you repeat it so often that it almost gets derived from the meaning of the actual words and yeah. it just becomes a thing where you can just end any conversation and be like no you just gotta trust the work like right. that's what you're supposed to do and so it was a uh, threading the needle on sort of what to take and then what to leave was a really difficult process because over the course of several years, Brother 12 tried a lot of different things and a lot of different ways to get people on board. So I tried to look at the things that were consistent over the entirety of his sort of like reign and sort mm -hmm. of take those things and then use them in ways that um, would be subtle at first. But as you sort of get deeper and deeper, you see them over and over again. So like, you know, if you look at the first two issues, Trust the Work probably pops up like. 20 30 times and it's just at the end of sentences and stuff mm -hmm. but i wanted readers to start thinking about it too and, sure. and sort of saying it to themselves as right they read it. well what is the work well the work is the work right exactly yeah, yeah yeah and it's like well if you don't want to do it then you can't trust it therefore you got to get out of here you know right <laughs> exactly mike yeah speaking again about the um historical accuracies um of the books was there um, a specific, like, uh, why the 20s? Why not do, like, say, the 70s, you know, 80s, when, you know, the cults were kind of hip and on CBS, all the, all, you know, on the evening news? Um, was, there, was there a particular reason for that era? Are you a fan um, of that era? Or is that kind of, because to me, that kind of added to the horror of, of yeah. the story. So, I mean, there's a there's a multi pronged answer to this. One is very mm. visceral and just like no nonsense is that like, I really think the 1920s is like, that's still an era where you could just like disappear. 
Sure. Like you could just go away and like you could murder someone and move 50, <laughs> 50 miles to another city and it's like and start a new life, right? Or you could have another family and there wasn't social media and there wasn't really mm -hmm. phones and there wasn't really electricity. So it was very difficult to sort of create a paper trail. And so like Brother 12 is sort of the epitome of that. He traveled through Canada. He called himself different names. He tried all these different things until he kind of got out West. And then he was like, no, I'm Brother 12. It's the Aquarium Foundation. But like he was a theosophist. He was called the White King, the Master, all these different things that he was trying out basically mm -hmm. since the early 1920s and then sort of like found the thing that worked and sort of stuck with it. But to go uh, into some of my other work for a second, mm -hmm, sure. last year, uh, Lonnie Nadler and I, my, my often co-writer, wrote the second volume of Undone by Blood, which was set in 1934. And so through doing research in, in that era and sort of looking at the 1930s, I was really fascinated with that pre-Great Depression moment where the 1920s is like boom town, right? Like everyone's like making tons of money, feeling pretty good. The Great War is about 10 years in the rear view mirror and it doesn't seem like things are bad for anyone. But if you are a disabled veteran, you might not feel the same way about the 1920s. Right. And I was very interested in how do you sort of like corrupt that really idealistic version of the 1920s that we have and then if you kind of set it right on the precipice of the great depression and you have this guy who's saying something bad's going to happen real soon and you are someone who hasn't fit into all that glitz and glamour of the 1920s you're going to believe him and then you know as you get closer and closer to 1929 this is what happened in real life he kept telling people Something bad's going to happen in the 1930s. They're going to be terrible for everyone. The Great Depression happened. And then everyone who was at Cedar by the Sea was like, he's the guy. He's yeah. figured it out. Right. And then he had them hook, line and sinker. And so he was able to run his grift for another couple years without really any hiccups. And like someone had disappeared. Someone had accused him of stealing their money. At this point, he had multiple wives. Uh it was getting pretty out of control and normally that's how cults break down but 1929 happened and then everyone was right back in to his like they were just getting high off of his uh his lies basically and i thought that that was really interesting uh, because like you were saying like the 1970s the 1980s the 1960s we have all mm -hmm. these different cult stories but cults at their heart are sort of this disillusionment with the promise of society. And I think like that's so apt in the 1960s and the 1970s. And I hadn't really seen it reflected in the 1920s. So when I found this and I thought, I thought, hmm, that's a really great way to talk about how the promise of the 1920s didn't measure up for people. And I was also just fascinated, really fascinated in, in having a disabled protagonist mm -hmm. in this setting, because I, I was like, I don't, I haven't read a, a detective novel or much in the detective genre that does put a disabled protagonist front and center of all the action. Well, absolutely. And, and Guy's status, not only as a veteran who's clearly suffering with some PTSD long before anybody knew what PTSD was, you know, um, and his disabled status makes him a really interesting protagonist um what let, let's talk a little bit about the veteran side of him because like we've touched on already so many people disillusioned with the world and society post the great war um he absolutely fits into that mold so he's stuck in this between um knowing that this is this is bullshit and kind of feeling its pull and it all sort of hinges on his, the fact that he's a, a disaffected veteran expertly shown there in, in that first issue when he, he asked the priest for money and the priest is like, dude, it's been 10 years. Yeah. I'm not helping you. Yeah. Wow. yeah. But um, talk, talk to us a little bit about the personality of Guy and what all went into him. Yeah. So, I mean, um, Guy is basically, <clears throat> Guy was my grandfather's name. Ah. 
and is sort of a amalgamation of who my grandfather was. Not a perfect one to one, but I never really got to know him. He died right before I was born. Mm. And so he was a Montreal native and sort of was always torn between his English and French status, um, having an English wife and, and that kind of thing, kind of put him in this weird space in Montreal specifically. And I thought that that was really interesting because you have this person who immediately in Canada, if you're a native French speaker, you're in the minority just in general, just because we have one province where they speak French as an official language, and that's Quebec. And then we have Montreal that's very uh, French forward, but you can get by by speak speaking English. Hmm. <clears throat> so that duality was born in that character right from the get go. And then I started looking at um, for a different project at the, the history of disability rights in Canada. And I thought that just by happenstance that disability rights sort of kicked off post-World War I because of shell shock, because of our lack of understanding of, of wartime injuries, they thought these guys could just get back to work, you know, mm -hmm. and they and they would be fine. But it's like in the interim after World War I, the world had basically industrialized. And so it's like if you're missing your hand and you're going to go work on like a factory line, you're just you're not going to fit into that world. You know, uh, Guy, someone who's missing one of his eyes his death perception is completely off, doesn't fit within that world that has completely changed in the time that he's been gone. And so I really wanted to explore how you are an outsider in this, in this world of plenty, in this world where everyone is having a great time. How do you take someone's lens and go, this is someone who is basically forgotten. And to be perfectly honest, I, I grew up with a, a disabled parent, um, my father had a stroke when I was seven. And so I, I saw every day a world that wasn't made for him and, and wasn't built to accommodate him. And so it's been a really important part of my journey as a writer to sort of take that experience that I've had and sort of filter it through these genre lenses to sort of look at how we can talk about these things in ways that are not like super overt or beating you over the head, but just sort of saying like, this is a perspective of someone who is in a unique position to smell the bullshit of this cult, to be perfectly honest, but is still kind of enchanted by it. Right. And what does that say about him? What does that say about how he's been failed? And, and frankly, what does that tell us about this part of history and sort of, you know, someone who basically like, not to get too in the weeds, but during World War I, most Canadians who, who fought on behalf of Canadian soldiers were British. Like 80% of them were just British settlers who went over and fought Germany. But when it came to Montreal, there was a lot of first-generation Canadians, French-speaking, who went over. But they were put in their own contingent, and they were separated. Really? And yeah, and due to casual racism, something that is as old as time, they were put into the hardest battles in the war. They fought all the most grueling battles. And so, like, I was like, that's so fascinating. Like, if you take this guy and you, he's a French Canadian and he's like, I don't even know if I fit into Canada before the war. And then he goes over there anyway because it's important. And then he's put through hell, you know half of his face is blown off he's in a french hospital for two or three years mm -hmm. and he comes back to this country he's gonna feel pretty disillusioned by the whole thing sure. you know what i mean sure. and so like that was a, a huge thing for me i think we're all probably having this moment where we're kind of going looking at our countries and going i don't know if the promise of what we <laughs> what we were born with is really coming true you know and so you start mm -hmm. to look around and go what what the hell is there yeah. and so it it just sort of was this perfect amalgamation of modern history my goals as a writer and sort of my personal experience sort of like blending together in this hodgepodge of a cult story <laughs> heck of a heck of a thing uh and and don't get it twisted because i think that and you know obviously not knowing where we're going to go with the brother of all men how his story is going to end but 
I think given what you just said, there's ample room for several prequel stories involving his time as a PI. So I I wouldn't be, you know, if we if we ever want to return to the world of Gee someday, I, I feel like you could you've got plenty to work with there. <laughs> I love the character and like I have to like use this opportunity to apologize to my editors because I sent them like an 18 page document that was like, here's every year of this guy's life. And <laughs> this is way more information than you guys even need. But I was really, Oh, so you Alan Moore it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I just find there's a, there's an element when you're working within history that there's all these things that you can kind of create these points that anchor your characters, these real things. And it gets, for me, I get carried away in, in research just in general. And so sure. it was this awesome opportunity to sort of like look at this person and figure out who they were at every stage of their life. And I think when you do that, writing them isn't tough. You know how they're going to react in a situation. Mm -hmm. You know what offends them. You know how they feel about themselves. You know how they feel about other people. So when other characters say something to them, it's almost like implicit how they'll respond because you've done all the work to sort of create a fully realized person. Right, right. Uh, Mike? Excuse me, sorry, cut, cut off guard. Um, Zach, yeah. <laughs> um, with all the, the research, um, with both historical and just, you know, kind of um, putting in the general background, um, what was one of your favorite stages of the research for the story what? yeah i think um well the two-pronged answer as per usual mm -hmm. but reading about world war one uh specifically canada's involvement mm -hmm. you know i'm sure you guys probably had the same reaction but when you're in high school and someone's like here's what's going on with your country that you find boring <laughs> and something that happened 100 years ago you're like yawn right. i don't want to hear about it right <laughs> but then when you get a little older and you start to realize like, oh, this was pretty instrumental in shaping the country as I know it now. And you start to kind of look at these things. That's so interesting to me because it, you know, having that perspective that you do now, you can kind of see how these things feed into modern history and sort of have formed um, different institutions or, or whatever. So like I was saying, like disability rights were sort of born in Canada by virtue of our immense failure of our World War I vets. So when it came time for World War II and all these men came back, we had plans in place, we had funding in place, and we helped them reintegrate into society um, when we didn't do that during World War I. But then the, beyond The American that, government didn't even want to pay their guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me just yeah. one-up you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean... Yeah, that's the thing, right? When I look at Canadian history and then I look at American history, I'm like, ah, it's just a worse version where like treated people even worse than we did. Like, yeah. yikes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're the cousins that don't bring anything to the picnic. That's, <laughs> it's, that's our role. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond um, World War I stuff, what I found really interesting was like in the second issue, um, they're doing like full scale logging. And I was like, that's really cool. And you read about that and you're like, I'm going to put that in the book. But then you're like, I don't know how to do that. Not right. only do I not know how to do that, but I don't know how they did that in the 1920s. And so you have to start really looking in. Like I was finding old like pinhole camera footage of dudes in black and white in the, in the 1920s, like cutting down these massive trees. And so I wanted to really make sure that it was immersive, but also correct the era. So like did a lot of work kind of uncovering archival early sort of like come to Canada footage of, of loggers and stuff and looking at every part of the process um, in these like silent films essentially. And like it took time and was, painstaking but like everything in that second issue about how they're cutting down trees is accurate to the era and uh it you know was fun like I, again i didn't think it would be fun i was like oh i made a huge chore for myself but it's just visually like that there's a page in the second issue where they're like the full scale of the tree you can see how tiny they are in comparison to what they were cutting down and that's real like these dudes in the 1920s were like cutting down trees that are like as tall as sky 
uh, skyscrapers. True. No modern technology, right? They were right. cutting them down, hauling them through the woods, then usually throwing them into a river and then just like sending them downstream <laughs> and, and hoping for the best, you know? And it's like, huh. and you know, the people would die all the time and it was really hard work and it, and like, it wouldn't, it's not easy work now with modern technology. And so like a hundred years of that removed and it's just like, it's fascinating that people even signed up because yeah. I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Couldn't be me. Like, it's just whew, no gloves. I don't do heights. So that's good. No, uh, yeah. and that's one thing that, that comes through again brilliantly is just the the detail the the minute details like you're talking about the trees well how do they do that do that back then you know rather than just kind of throw something up there you you the the accuracy and just the detail and of the research really does come through um you know from like we already talked about the veteran stuff and the you know historically accurate stuff to just you know, the overall feel of the book, um, combining it with the horror and just that detail um, re really speaks the, the volumes and stuff, yeah. Awesome, well, thanks. <clears throat> you know, Zach, one of the things that's really jumped out at me in this conversation is just the level of research that you put into this. Now, you've pretty much always got something going and have for the last, I don't know, 10 years? Eight, 10 years-ish? I've been um, professionally in comics for six. Six. <laughs> okay. <it> <laughs> okay. I was trying to think like, when did I start hearing Nadler and Thompson? But, uh, <laughs> and, and, and them getting my attention. But, you know, it, you, you get to 41 and it all starts blurring together. Um, but there's a, so many of your books that clearly have a ton of research. Um, you know, we've been talking about The Brother of All Men, um, getting really deep with oddball very oddball pagan stuff with uh i breathe the body like very <laughs> obscure stuff um yeah. the, his, the history elements of um um uh, undone by blood and then you get to turn around and write something for marvel like devil's reign superior four and it's like fuck it dr octopus is wolverine now <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, Isn't yeah. That a nice little fun breather for you to get to do you know, fun things like that that yeah, don't think, require months off your life and research. I think that's sort of what I'm trying to strike a better balance with too, is that like, um, I talked to Lonnie about this a lot because we're both sort of cut from the same cloth and we came up together and now we're kind of finally doing our own thing, but we're still always working at least on one thing together. Um, and we've both sort of come to this realization that you kind of need stuff that you can work on that doesn't take you a year of your life um pouring yourself into the research mm -hmm, and that kind mm -hmm. of stuff because also that is a different set of muscles too like sure. the absurdity of superior four is somewhere that i can go and just play and it's very much kind of smashing action figures together yeah and there's still some interesting ideas there about you know what does it mean to have your legacy sort of tarnished by all these variants and all this stuff but at the end of the day it's not meant to be taken seriously really yeah, and it, right when you look at that cover you know that from the get-go and like that honestly is why i agreed to to do that project because they came to me and they said so we have like an evil fantastic four but all the members are going to be dr octopus and i was like that's insane I'm in. <laughs> Who <wouldn't laughs> and it was, <laughs> yeah. And it, it truly is like, I try all the time to sort of step outside my comfort zone and sort of explore things that I normally wouldn't. And so like mm -hmm. when I get asked to do something that maybe a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have said yes to, um, I try to like sort of see if there's an angle for me to do something that can surprise myself because like I have a book coming out in November through Mad Cave called Nature's Labyrinth. And really? it's like a battle royale style um, book where it's just like, it's a bloodbath. It's a multi-character blood over the top bloodbath set in an outdoor labyrinth that sort of mixes and changes with every issue. And again, not hugely research based, more mm -hmm. so grounded in character 
and sort of the dynamics of genre tropes and how to sort of like set expectations and then subvert them just through that sort of battle royale archetypal situation. And again, it was a challenge to myself to even like what I would love to do is go, okay, this is going to be in this very specific environment and I'm going to research the temperature and what kind of clothing they need to wear mm -hmm. and yada, yada, yada. But then you're spending a year writing something that one you don't own and, and two you don't control and all these other elements to it that you're basically putting a lot of your energy into something that um, it's better served with something that you own and control and can sure. build as slowly as you need to build it. Right. With, with Owen on brother 12 or the brother of all men, we've been working on that book for about a year. Um, that issue that came out two weeks ago, I mm -hmm. wrote that in June of, of 2021. Oh, wow. Um, so like there's a long sort of period of, of research even before that, that was probably started in January of that year. And so like, 18 months to kind of get it from nothing to on the shelf um, where you're reading it. And like, that's kind of my comfort zone because mm -hmm. I want to do stuff that uh, takes me a lot of time. One, because it makes me slow down and really think about the dynamics of the characters and what I want to say. But two, I think that that is how I've been able to create a unique body of work for myself in my creator own stuff, because it's highly specific, highly researched. And, you know, the only other person who's doing stuff like me is my co-writer, Lonnie. <laughs> hey. that's, and that's about it, you know? And so it's nice to feel like I found a space for myself that's a little bit different. Um, not to say other people don't do research, just that I try to take my time and, and really make sure that when I'm on to a creator own book, that's something I can like, give 110 well, yeah you, you you want to right i mean when it's yeah. when it's your big story that you want to tell you're not going to half ass it at least i hope um <laughs> and and that's what leads to to really memorable works um one thing i have noticed though about um your career thus far is it's dotted with lots of mini series Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering for you is a what's the appeal of the miniseries and B do you have any ongoings uh, percolating that you'd like to pitch somewhere at some point? So I'm drawn to things with a definitive ending um, mm -hmm. in that I feel like uh, comics has been dominated for years by multi-issue runs that sort of can, meander or, or sort of out of a dead spot or or what have you and what i love is like in a miniseries everything has intention sure every page has meaning it's all Beginning building towards something in. yeah and and frankly like with going to undone by blood where we very gave it a very definitive ending and then the publisher came back and said this is successful. We want to keep it going. And Lonnie and I looked at each other and we're kind of like, oh shit, like we didn't have a plan <laughs> for how we could keep this going. And so we had to kind of go to the drawing board and, and sort of think of a different way to sort of approach the series. And I'm really happy we came up with what we did with that anthology format. But I think for me, I've always been drawn to things that sort of have that definitive closure because one, that's very satisfying as a reader. And two, I think that's how you earn trust early on as a writer, because if I was writing something that I started five years ago and it's still it's, you know, maybe we've gotten 20 issues out in, in five, six years. That's fine. And I'm sure there are people who are still reading issue 20. But I think if I can give you a trade and say, hey, if you like X here, read Y. And if you're satisfied with that, you might like the rest of my work. I think it's easier to sort of get someone's buy-in if they only have to spend an hour reading your work and then they go, okay, I know what this guy is about. And there's all these other things that are complete and, and easy to sort of pick up, read, digest, and move on. Having said that, after doing this for years, I'm very attracted to the idea of doing longer things. And I'm actually working on my first sort of maxi series right now. Um, so I'm like writing the second arc as the first arc is being drawn. And that's been really cool because it's allowed me to sort of go again. It's a, it's a creator own thing. Mm 
mm-hmm. with someone that I've worked with in the past and it's our chance to sort of do something a little bit bigger. And it's been really awesome because it's like, get to put all that research in, but then I also get to spread it out a little bit longer. And so it's going to be like a two arc thing that will kind of come out with like the first arc and then maybe a two or three month break and then kind of coming back into the world and wrapping everything up and so like for the first time ever i'm not getting to the end of the first arc and having to like wrap everything up but sort of create opportunity for more and create more story and just today actually i pitched another maxi series that's even longer than um this one and the idea being to do something that runs for a full year um, 12 months in a row and and sort of trying that out. And I want to kind of gradually get there because there's also, there's a different ebb and flow to, to that sort of storytelling that I think, um, you know, like a mini series is cool because like I said, the, you're building towards the definitive ending and people know it's four or five issues that's on my pull list. And then I, you know, I can move on and put a new mini series on my pull list. It's a different thing to be like, hey, come with me for the full year. And so I'm trying to make sure that when I gradually sort of build my career into that mode, that's also something that I'm thinking about storytelling differently. And so when I get to those points in time that the stories earn it, because I feel like we've all read comics that maybe wore out their welcome um, by just sticking around a little too long, you know? And, And I think that like, knowing when to end something is a very um, valuable skill. <laughs> I think so too. And and you kind of answered what was going to be my next question, which was uh, maybe rephrasing, you know, not, a, not an ongoing, but a finite series of uh, 50 or 60 issues, you know, pre your preacher, your scalp, your sand, mm. whatever. Um, but, but I dig that. And I like the fact too, that you're, kind of everywhere got with all of your hands in these different pots not just in genres but with publishers right you've mm-hmm. you've done, obviously done work with marvel you've clearly got a really good relationship with uh aftershock uh and now you're talking about mad cave too um what what is it about a particular publisher that draws you to say okay i think this house would be a good fit for this story I think at the end of the day, and this is something that's taken me a little while to learn, but I I think this is what I tell creators now all the time is like, go where you're wanted, go where people are excited about you. Because I've been in situations where I'll have an idea and I'm really passionate about it. And I'm actually spending way too much time trying to get people on board. Mm -hmm. And then you're sort of like, you're exhausted by the prospect of just even pitching it. And what I've been finding lately is the publishers that I've been working with are really excited about the stuff that I'm bringing them. And then I'm just sort of more drawn to working with those people who are excited about what I'm doing. So like Aftershock was a publisher who came to me early Mm -hmm. and they said, we like what you're doing and we want you to do it here. And I said, cool. Didn't know how it would work out. And then like I've done, I think seven books there, but I've done that because I love their editorial team. Every single time that I pitch them something, it's very different than the last thing that I pitched them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they're always down. They there's no sort of like parameters in which I have to sort of like get in line with the publisher's lockstep vision. Right. (coughs) And that's, I think, important for me because they're sort of allowing me to develop my voice as a creator. Mad Cave was a similar experience where they came to me and they said, we want you to write a book for us. Not only that, but we kind of want you to do whatever you want to do. What do you think about some of these ideas? And they presented me with some stuff. And I was like, I like this, but I'd like to change this, this, and this. And they said, absolutely no problem. And we were kind of off to the races. And they've been very supportive from the get-go. And a uh, similar experience, I, I just started working with DC. And they called mm-hmm. me and they said, hey, we want you to write Batman. And not only that, but we want you to write Zach Thompson's Batman. And I was like, all right, you don't really get that call very often in your life. Right? So, yeah. So I was like, hell yeah, let's go. And so like they, they've been very supportive and, and very collaborative and mm-hmm. are just like, 
again, I've, I found that like, if you go where you're wanted and you go where people are excited about you, there's so much less friction in the creative process, but also you just create better work because you're yeah. more passionate about it. The people behind the books are more passionate about it and everything sort of flows from there. And I think that like, you can read a comic and tell that people were having fun when they yes. were making it. Absolutely. Um, you're, you're very fortunate to have the creative team that you're working with. You got Owen, uh, Mark Engler, and the very great, um, very always Eisner worthy Hassan Oates Man Elhow. And I probably just mangled his last name, but um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, these are all like, really really talented capable creators and they, they put together with you this vision for a story that has just a really unique look to it um did did you how much of a hand did you wind up having in in putting that creative assemblage together so um owen and i have been talking about working together for a while and this was something that was sort of gestating for a long time and he's very interested in crime and sort of that gritty sort of 1970s texture that I mm -hmm. really wanted to bring to this book. And so when it came time to uh, put a team together, I kind of went with the, to him with this idea and I said, hey, I know this real cult leader in Canadian history. Is this something that would be of any interest to you? And he jumped all over it right away. Who wouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> so like we, we had a lot of fun building that out. And so Mark and Hassan kind of came up after the fact, obviously. But um, Hassan is someone I work with constantly because I can kind of say to him, hey, here's the tone, here's the flavor, but I want to do something different with the letters. And mm -hmm. every single time he comes in and absolutely crushes it. Yes. And yeah, and so like it's, you know, I think I don't think I've worked with another letterer on a creator own book. It's probably been two or three years now because we just have such a great relationship and a shorthand. And also I'm getting to the point now where I write scripts for Hassan. So I say, Hey, mm -hmm. I want this to look a certain way. So there was like an element in issue two where like brother 12 is walking through his estate and there's all these little like circular or like half circle lettering boxes above each frame of the window. Mm -hmm. And that was a feature in the art. And I saw that as I was doing the lettering pass and I wrote a note to Hassan. I was like, can we fit the six captions into these six little boxes? And then he sends me back a screenshot and he's like, I think I made it work. And we just had this moment of like, I was like, oh, I'm writing for him at this point, which is really fun. And sort of like that, I feel like is the ultimate level of collaboration where you're mm -hmm. sort of like everyone's sort of talking about how to approach all these things. And it's not like a necessarily like, Oh, like stay in your lane or anything like that. So I like right. to just kind of bring that element to it. And then like with Mark, Mark was someone who was new to me. Um, very like incredible colorist. I was a big fan of his work um, on shipwreck at aftershock. He mm -hmm. colored Phil Hester on that, on that book. And it's just this like really muted, wonderful palette. And I always had it, this it looks of like this... it's part of the era that it's evolving, yeah. right? Yeah, like and that was a huge colors, thing. They're like, oh, okay, 1920s, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that, and that was like that grit of like a 1970s film. But like mm -hmm. what I kept saying to him was like, imagine if you set up a film camera in the 1920s, what would it look like? And then he kind of came back and colored the first issue and it was like perfect. And so like... Yeah. We're at the point now where there's no real back and forth. Like everyone kind of knows what they got to do. And every time they turn in their first pass, it's just perfect. So it's like, that's a big thing for me is like working on tone early on, having collaborative conversations with everyone on board. So we can kind of come at it from a unified vision. So once production starts, we're not having questions about, people's hair color or what sort of the the tone of of the book should look like or feel so it's like it's all about evoking a certain aesthetic and then sort of committing to that and then sort of seeing it through from first page to last page mike do you want to jump in we got we're, we're 
Yeah, real quick. Real down quick. about our last five-ish minutes. Yeah, yeah. Real quick, total softball question, though, that I've been dying to kind of work in, but there's just no way, so I'm just going to go for it here. Um, yeah, real <laughs> quick about um, just your your writing influences and, and folks that have inspired you. Um, I'm a huge fan of I Breathe the Body, and there was portions of it that kind of were reminiscent of maybe something like, you know, Clive Barker would hit on and stuff like that. Um, so I was just wondering if, and, and there was hints of, you know, you know, some, you know, some, some Stephen King a little bit here and there, um, and a brother of all men. So I was just curious were some of those, your influence in writing or who, especially in the horror genre, um, who has, uh, kind of influenced you? Uh, Clive is my Holy grail to be perfectly honest. He's the guy, um, that I started reading his writing and was like, oh, I want to be a writer. And like, has has been, um, I Breathe the Body was specifically crafted as a love letter to his work and written as a way to cha challenge myself, but also to try and write in his voice and, and try very hard to sort of like communicate really visceral ideas with those poetic flourishes that he's known for and also giving humanity to the inhumane and, and all of those themes that are so common in his work. That's all there. And I breathe the body. Um, but like more modern, um, huge fan of Jeff Vandermeer and like love his work and really think that he's probably one of the most interesting authors working today um, because his work is like, it almost defies classification. It's very challenging at times or sometimes very streamlined. Um, and yeah, I love Stephen King. I feel like you, you, you know, can't find a writer who doesn't love Stephen King. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then um, Alan Moore obviously is a huge, huge influence just in terms of like, there's a, um, a lot of time and attention spent when I'm scripting in, to how pages flow into one another and the transitions between things and also transitions on the page. And that's a very Alan Moore thing that picked up from, from just studying his writing and how, how much his stuff flows and how you find yourself turning pages without even really thinking of it because the seamless sort of like, there's a, a thing in issue one where a gas attendant spills gas on Guy's foot. And then you see him like, claps onto the bar and someone spills beer onto his arm and the actions are not the same, but they have that same weight and feel to them. And so that pulls you through the page. And that's something that I feel like Alan Moore simply perfected as a comic book writer. And we're all sort of still trying to figure out how to, how to keep up with them. And then um, it's sacrilege, but also Grant Morrison is a huge influence and just absolutely adore their work and, and find myself, um, revisiting their work and always finding new things to sort of discover within it. And it's like this wonderful treasure trove where it's like, I reread animal man while I was writing case and found new things to sort of like see in that. And like, that's so interesting as something I've read three or four times already to go back for like a fifth time and see new things. You're just like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> had it figured out. Yeah. Had it figured out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I think I think a lot of the writers that you just just mentioned, I, I think you're in pretty good company with them. Um, the you know, you mentioned Alan Moore. And the first thing I thought uh, as both a reader of his and yours was um, from hell, the level mm -hmm. of just visceral uh, gore compared to I Breathe the Body, which is whoa <laughs> there's a skinless dude on the cover yeah. um yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i mean just like like you're saying that intentionality and there's a ton of that in uh, all of your work like even as you put it the lighter hearted fair like uh superior four it's there's there's no you know everything is is a very very well placed chekhov's gun and I just really, really look forward to new Zach Thompson comics. So I just, I really wanted to tip my hat to you and take a moment to appreciate the work that you're doing because I, I don't miss your stuff. Um, well, thank you. And I'm, thank you, I, you know, I, I, 
I've been, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> I've been reading comics for over 30 years now. And like, it's always exciting when somebody new pops up, right? It's like, oh, okay, well, this Garth Ennis comic was great, but I've been reading Garth Ennis for 25 years. Oh shit. Here's this new person, you know? And, um, you and and Lonnie and yes Zach Kaplan uh, <laughs> and this whole um, the, the, the other vanguard of, of writers that are coming up and just saying well okay I guess I'll take I'll, I'll do some work at Marvel or DC if they want to throw it my way but your intent is more to tell your stories your way mm -hmm. at Mad Cave at Vault at Aftershock I just that to me as a reader is more exciting than anything else because it's an evolution in the form. It's an evolution in the way that creators are viewing not just their work, but their value as creators. Right. And man, I just, it thrills me to know in to watch it happen and watch writers like yourself and Lonnie and, um, God, every you know everybody that's just really breaking big right now out there. Chris Condon um, comes to mind, and you know I just I, I'm I'm glad that you all are out there doing what you're doing. And um, you know, <laughs> comics like The Brother of All Men, they're what's going to sustain comics creatively in the next decades to come. Right? Oh man, like Spider Man's well, not going anywhere. So. <laughs> right, Batman. He's not going anywhere. They're gonna be there. Yeah. They're all about IP. They're owned mm -hmm. by the biggest companies on world in the world. Yay! I, it's cool. I mean, hell, Ram V is writing Batman. I can't complain about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Neither can I. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I mean, yeah. obviously they're doing something right, but it's it's the it's the guys like you that are out there on the actual frontier mining new ground that are, are truly exciting to watch Zach. So thank you for everything that you're doing out there. Um, uh, thanks for saying so, man. That's, oh, yeah, that's really most generous. definitely, dude. Most definitely. Um, I'll tell you what, I, 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 I'd, love to, I'd love to keep the conversation going, but we're a little over an hour now. Um, yeah. Zach, I want to be respectful of your time. So thank you so, so much, especially on short notice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow, that was kind of surprising. Um, but I appreciate you being a good sport about it. Um, and, uh, thank you for hanging out with us. Um, we will be back next week. The comic is the brother of all men. The writer is Zach Thompson. The publisher is aftershock. You should buy it now. Yes. Two, is, two issues are out three more to go. Do not wait for the trade because it's very kick-ass. And that is how you, getting out there and buying those singles is how you support your local comic store, which is one something you love to talk about around here. Uh, the world is a crabby place more often than not, unfortunately, but it doesn't have to be. And with that thought, I leave this with you. A, for you, a, a simple, small act of kindness goes a very, very long way. Thank you all so much for listening. And uh, Mike and yep. Matt... And uh, our Silly Comic Watcher show will be back next week. Thank you so much for listening.